Hi, Super Solars. Welcome to the best of the Oprah show. Today, we're asking the question, what is it that keeps you from having a happy love life? There have been some fundamental moments on the Oprah show that changed the course of what I believed you could do with television. And when I did this show that you're about to see with relationship expert, Dr. Harville Hendricks, I had such a huge aha moment. Just, it was big, big and bigger. I can tell you this for sure. Stedman and I would not still be together had I not had Harville Hendricks on this show. Harville says that you end up drawing to yourself the person who brings up the wounds of your early childhood experience. And that is why that person is there to help you heal. That fundamental understanding changed the way I looked at my relationship with Stedman. And I'm hoping that this show will help all of you to recognize patterns that keep you repeating in the partners that you choose. And the beauty of this show is that it applies to everybody, whether you're married, divorced, single, looking. I try to teach this to my girls at school. You're going to attract the person who most reminds you and brings up the wounds of your past. If you know that going in, you look at the whole experience differently. This is powerful stuff. In this hour ahead, we're gonna look at a relationship that is just ending and one that is just beginning and all the problems that happen in between. And guiding us through this hour is a man who has done really some incredible groundbreaking work with couples by helping to teach us to examine the patterns that we set up in our childhood. Now, once you get it, it, I'm telling you, it changes the way you look at the choices that you've made. Harville Hendricks is the author of Getting the Love You Want, and his book is Keeping the Love You Find. It's now out in paperback. He also has this great series of home videos for couples that you're gonna be seeing throughout this program. So, we've Hi. learned a lot from you. Thank you. Learned a lot from you. I've learned a lot from you. Oh, thank you very yes, much. Indeed. Now, I, one of the things I like about this is that there are a whole lot of cause and effects that you set up. Yes. Um, one that concerns me is if you were abused as a child, you may pick an abusive partner or be an abuser yourself. Yes. The, uh, that's uh, always the case. That whatever happens in childhood, whether it's mild or intense, there's something that's going to replicate itself in adulthood in an intimate partnership. Because the early childhood experience where there's a wound has to be repaired, and it always has to be repaired in a relationship in adulthood with somebody similar to your parents. Now, doesn't, can't you get over that, though? Because, see, I believe that, that all of my relationships in my 20s and early 30s yeah. were, were, I continued the abusive th pattern that I'd set up in my yes. childhood. Stedman is not an abu abusive person, so I think I've gotten over that. Yeah, and that's the clue when you're saying that in the 20s and 30s you began to work on some things in yeah. yourself. That, that means, yes, you can get over it, but only if you work on it. And yeah, you, because you interestingly enough, it. Harville, as you know, I've said this to you, <clears throat> when I first started, you know, dating Stedman, he was yeah. so kind to me, I thought something was wrong with yeah, him. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> he, thought, didn't, he didn't fit the early he patterns. Didn't fit he was me. supposed thought, to be a more difficult him? person. And also, it was a little yeah. boring at and first. And a little boring at first. Being treated right. so well. You're supposed to get that old bad stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was so used to being treated badly that when somebody treated me well, it was yeah. like, Okay, so now you but think I've broken But what's amazing it. is that you stayed with the process, that many times when people meet a person who can I be constructive in their life, I had to work through the boredom. But you had to it. work that through. Because yeah. mm -hmm. often you throw that person away. They're too boredom boring. Boredom meaning being treated well. You know, being I'd treated say, well, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And you throw them away because they're boring, they're treating us well, we're not getting the drama we got in childhood, or right. we throw them away because we are getting the drama, because we are getting the hurts. So it sounds like you stayed through that process of I going through the board. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Now, this is interesting. If you have a problem with trust, you probably grew up in a home. Anybody have a problem with trust? Okay. Okay. If you have a problem with trust, it's because you grew up in a home where somebody probably left you or abandoned you. And so the trust is issue true? of reliable people is, is, uh, is replicated in adulthood. Really? So how do you then get over it? I know somebody's going through that. Well, one is like you, you have to work on it and you can work on it in any number of relationships over time, the place where most people have to work on it is in the relationship they commit to. And they will always commit to find somebody who will be unreliable for them. And what they have to do is become conscious of that pattern repeating itself. And then the person who is unreliable has to learn to be reliable. But isn't it also true that if you grew up in a relationship where 
um, you were abandoned, either yes. emotionally or physically abandoned. Your parents died or young, or your parents divorced, and you felt a sense of abandonment. That you can pick somebody, and they're not really doing anything to cause you yes. to mistrust, but you are so you, you have those buried feelings, you, right. so you all automatically think they're going to be not trusted, right. and then because you say that all the time, they begin to they react become, to, yeah. to and, do that. And that's and that's a very common tactic too. Really, in the technical term for that is projective identification. That means I project on to that you're not trustful, yeah. and then after a while the person begins to be distrustful. Be distrustful. They begin to act like what you think they're going to act like. We Why say do they you do either that? you either pick them, provoke them, or project onto them. But if you had a <laughs> if you had a problem in childhood, you're going to pick somebody to help you redo it. If they don't, then you'll project onto them that they are, and if they're not, you'll provoke them into doing it. Because we have to resolve that issue. Okay. This is, the, this is such important work that you're doing, and I've really learned out of all the shows that I've done, I think I've really learned the most from you, because no. you were the person who started this. Thank you. And started, I think, the country thinking about how patterns that you set up in your childhood are always things that you repeat. Do you all get that now? Because I think when we first, remember the very first show we did where people said, oh, no, my oh, parents don't have anything yes, to do with right. the person I married. Yes, and I remember you saying, uh, childhood influences who you marry. Get it. Get it. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. It's if you beautiful. were smothered in your childhood, you'll fall in love with somebody who will smother you or you'll smother them or both. Yes. If you had a possessive, overprotective parent, mm -hmm. uh, you'll, you'll, you'll resent that. But you'll, in, you'll internalize two different patterns. One is you'll grow up and you'll attract somebody who is uh, possessive. But if they don't start doing that, then you'll switch. It's like in in, a, in an adult relationship, you'll either act like the child that you did with your parents, or you'll behave like the parents behaved toward you as a child. Isn't that fascinating? It's really fascinating, and it's so predictable. That until you, you break the pattern. Until you break the pattern, and you have to break the pattern by becoming conscious of it, and then deliberately, intentionally saying, I'm going to back off and not be a possessive person anymore. I'm gonna let this person have some space. And that changes something in you, uh, or you're going to say, yeah, I've never asked for space before. I've been dominated and smothered and I've kind of, you know, yielded to it. I'm going to ask for space. But it has to become an awareness, a consciousness, and then a decision to act in a different way. Yeah, the magnificent thing about this, if you sit down and think of it, I mean, because I know a lot of people, because I've been in conversations with people trying to explain this, and everybody, well, a lot of people rejected it first. But then if you think about it, what you just said, either you be, you're the child mm -hmm. or you are the parent. Or the parent. And the reason you are that way is because what? Well, because in childhood you absorb the parents and internalize them inside you just like a sponge takes parent in water. Parent or whoever was the leading or guardian. Whoever the caretakers caretaker. were that on whom you were dependent for. So you have that inside and then you have your experience of being a child with those persons. So in adulthood, when the stimulus comes to be in the child mode, you'll go, you'll regress, or uh, somebody may be acting like a child, you'll shift to the parent mode. But that's your model. So you've internalized the model. model. And then so you behave out of the model you knew until... And, and people who deny it, you can't help but act like that because that's what you know. That's, that's what, what you know. Saying. That's okay. right. Okay. Now, if you were criticized as a child, what happens? Well, if you're criticized as a child, then you will marry a critic in order to maintain the relationship and resolve that, or you'll nodding. become a very critical person. <laughs> or become a critical person. You'll become a critical person yourself. And you'll switch back and forth. If your partner isn't criticizing you so that you feel like a child, then you'll find something to criticize in them, so you take the parent role and put them in the role of the child. Okay, if you were shamed in childhood. This is a really hard one, because if you were shamed in childhood, it meant you were made to feel bad, like you were bad. Not right. that you did bad things, right. but that as a person you're bad. And you will then grow up, uh, that's an unresolved problem. You'll look for a shamer in order to work the shaming issue through. That's the thing we have to say over, over and over again. Or you'll do it to yourself. Or you'll do it to yourself, or you'll do it to the partner that you connect. Because, and the whole thing is not that we just like repeating patterns. Pattern repeating is trying to resolve the pattern you're repeating. So we need to look at this as a positive attempt. And people, Peter Piper picked a picker. Peter Piper picked a picker. <laughs> pattern <laughs> repeating is trying to resolve the patterns you're repeating. That's right. That's right. You repeat it not to experience it again, but to not experience it again. You repeat it because you're trying not to. Because you're trying not to. And consciousness, but you, but you keep on doing it because you don't have another option. Okay. You're trying to solve a problem. In repeating a pattern, you're trying to solve a problem. But you recreate the problem if you repeat the pattern without consciousness. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Y'all got it? Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> We're going to be uh, right back. But first, uh, Harva, why do you get uh, uh, emotional in this clip with... Uh... Oh, in, in this clip, Helen, uh, Helen and I are having a conversation, and she... I experienced being, all of me being accepted for the, I feel it almost, uh, the emotion again now. Mm -hmm. All of me being accepted, not having to prove myself, there's no part of me that she rejects. And I finally experienced that she's relating to me that way as a consistent pattern in our relationship. Uh -huh. And that's kind of emotional to have every part of you accepted and loved. Okay, and also, uh, we've been, we're gonna be talking to some couples who are separating and couples who are beginning, and we're gonna be dealing with that. But let's take a look at this video with Harvard right now. One of the most thrilling things about the conscious marriage is that it really does invite a person to deepen their own spirituality or develop their higher selves or however you want to phrase it, which um, has been such a gift to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I'm not looking for Harville to meet all of my needs. I look to my own spirituality to meet a lot so that I can be there for Harville. And then he does the same for me and he has resources for me. It's a growing feeling that all of me is acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't know that was so meaningful to me until I said it well, to I you think, right now. I think... And I want to thank you for that. <laughs> With that clip we just saw when we went into commercial break, that was Harville and uh, his wife, Helen. And I was saying, that is really, that's, I mean, I got a little goosebump looking at it because that's what marriage should feel like. You should feel like you're, it should be like unconditional love. Mm -hmm. You should feel like you're totally yeah. supported and loved just because of who you are. Yes. Yeah. And it doesn't start that way. I mean, Helen and I are very candid in saying it took us about seven years really? of really hard work and hard struggle and fighting using the processes that we both knew about uh -huh. and were developing together uh -huh. to get to the point where we experienced a kind of change from a conflicted relationship to a basically safe one with a little conflict. It used to be a lot of conflict and a little safety. Uh -huh. And now it's mainly safety and enjoyment and pleasure and occasional conflict. But it's a seven-year process for us. Yes, but, uh, yeah, you know, and I've been, you know, speaking of myself, dating for about that long, too. And no. because of the things that I've learned from doing the show and reading books like yours, what I've learned is, is that, you know, the, to be able to accept a person for just who they are, which is a mistake that so many people on this show mm -hmm. have made, mm -hmm. is that they come on and they are or they went into marriage with an idea of it yes. and expected the person to change somehow yes. or expected the person to fit their idea right. of what the marriage was going to be. But that person didn't know that your idea was this and my idea no. was that. No, <laughs> unfortunately, right? you know, they're not walking around with your pictures in their head about who they <laughs> right. should be. So one of the things so. you, that you do in the book Keeping the Love You Find, one of the things I thought is that there's this whole questionnaire yes. where you get to write what you, what you expect, what he expects. Right. What, yeah, and we've done that. And, once you, and when you get the writing, you become also aware that you have a picture in your mind. Sometimes you don't even know you have an ideal picture. But do you know what is so fascinating to me? When I did that exercise, uh, excuse me for talking about myself, but when I did that exercise <laughs> is that I realized that I really didn't have, it makes me emotional thinking about it, I didn't have a picture of what marriage was because my parents never married. Uh. So it was very hard for me to answer those questions because I had no idea of what it's supposed to be or yeah. what that means. So no model. In, uh, in, inside right. your own mind about what marriage is supposed to be. So it had to be totally a construct. Yeah, so I'm making e it up. So you make it up either, <laughs> either from the pictures that are available in the culture or yeah. other people's or from your own imagination. But then even wherever you get the picture, when you get into the marriage, it doesn't fit the picture. So then you it try doesn't to, fit the picture. It doesn't fit the picture. And then you try to get the person to fit the picture. That's what a lot of people have done. And they don't know that they're supposed to have a role in your movie. Uh, or you in their movie, and uh -huh. so consequently that's what produces the conflict. Now we used to think that was a really destructive thing. What we're now beginning to understand that conflict is really natural. Right. That you can't avoid this process. It's natural and it's the precondition for the kind of growth you need to do in adulthood that you fail to do in childhood. Because all relationships, especially intimate ones, are there to help teach you to grow. All that's all there they're there to there teach for. you to grow. Okay. Right. Now, I want you to meet Dale and Carrie because after nine years of dating, eight years of marriage, <clears throat> they are now considering divorce. Did any of this uh, sound familiar to you? Quite a bit. Uh, until, I'll be honest with you, until you mentioned that about the critiquing, that if you had somebody that somewhat critiqued you during your childhood, that you might find somebody to critique you mm -hmm. as an adult. Until that moment, I absolutely had no idea. That's pretty much exactly what I did. While I'm sure it was meant to be positive in my growing up, there was a lot of critiquing, mm -hmm. and that's, I think, where I became so stubborn 
and decided to prove I was who I was. Yeah. And um, I did pick someone who could teach. Yeah, I saw you shaking your head when I was speaking, so I know some of yeah, this Yeah, well, wasn't... I know I'm very critical of her. Uh -huh. So that's exactly what she's talking about. And you were criticized a lot as a child. In a lot of ways, it was for the betterment, but it was always, because I was always pretty stubborn. I uh -huh. kind of wanted to hold my own and be who I was, and even if it was a little bit different, so. And that's the interesting thing about criticism. It's always come from parents with their best intentions. Criticism right. is designed to improve you. Mm -hmm. right. But we, what we don't know is criticism actually results in injuring you. Well, and I also agree about the conflict thing, and it would be great if you could get it out earlier as a child, because I try that a lot with our son. You know, Drake, if you're angry, let us know, and this, that, and the other, because I think if you do hold it in your whole childhood, it does come out. It will come out. Later, yes. and where it shouldn't be coming out. Okay, so why are you all thinking of divorcing now? Because maybe after hearing all this, you could work the stuff out. Yeah, <laughs> maybe after. Yes, uh, well, especially what you were saying about the critiquing. Honestly, that hit like, bam, bam. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Absolutely couldn't believe it. Yeah. In a matter of lifestyle, too. We, we want different things. We want we're, different things. We're both strong, strong people. Stand up for our own rights so much that I think we forgot to melt. Right. We don't argue. We never had problems with fighting, arguing. Um, it was mostly... Uh, she wanted one thing in life, and I wanted something entirely different. I wanted to live in, boy, well, I live in Boca Raton, Florida, and I wanted to stay there and, and just enjoy that kind of a life. Carrie uh, wanted to be back in Chicago where her friends and her, you know, more activity mm -hmm. where she could go to things and to show Drake, you know, the different activities that are here. And I didn't blame her on that. As I said, I couldn't bring myself to so doing it. Are you all going to divorce now? Mm -hmm. You're going to divorce. Now, what is it? You, there's something you say in the book. I forgot exactly the phrasing. That unless you really separate, unless you say goodbye to that, then you what? Something happens. Well, if you don't say goodbye to the relationship, or at least to the marriage, if you want to keep the relationship, then you will carry the unresolved issues of that relationship into the next relationship. It, there's a grief process you have to go through, uh, and the goodbye process is to help that. Back in a moment. This is being able to separate yourself, really, from the relationship. Right. The, the whole point is that you need, in preparation for marriage, you need to finish what you didn't finish or what's left over from another relationship. And this goodbye process is a sense, an essential ingredient in getting ready to go on to your next relationship or to go on to your life if you decide not to go on to another relationship, but to finish that. And so what we're going to do is a goodbye process, and you've decided, Carrie, that you're going to... Uh, do the goodbye part, and I'm going to ask you to just listen to it, and um, and I may prompt you to do some mirroring back, to say back to her what you're hearing her say. Mm -hmm. Now, the structure is to start by saying goodbye to the bad stuff in the relationship that won't ever be again. So why don't you start with that? I'd like to say goodbye to being critiqued as often as I was, to always having to prove that I'm better than what you thought I was. And I'd like to say goodbye to some of the frugality that existed between us. And um, I'll be happy to say goodbye to the struggling with who I am on the one hand to make you happy and on the other to make me happy. Okay, so just, yeah. just briefly, can you paraphrase back the part, the bad part she's saying goodbye to in the relationship? Sure. Uh, Actually, the critiquing, she's right. I. Yeah, and, and don't explain it. Just say, so I'm hearing you say, you're saying goodbye to the critiquing. Right. Just and mirror it back and paraphrase it back. To the living up to my standards instead of yours and doing what I want you to do. And uh, I really don't feel that any of that's true. No, however. no, I don't, don't want you to come. I just want you to paraphrase back <laughs> okay. what you're hearing. Because in the goodbye process, we don't want an argument. We just want her to, because this is her experiencing, we want her to say goodbye to her side of this. Okay. And if we had a whole process, then we would ask you to say goodbye to all of the okay. bad stuff on your well, side. But we won't have time to do that well, at I this point. Well, I think I covered it. Okay? Yeah. So now shift to the next thing. What is the good stuff in the relationship that won't ever be again because of the uh, end of the relationship? I guess I'll have to say goodbye to the warmth and comfort I feel with you, um, the joy I get out of both of us watching what Drake does, how he grows. Um, I have to say goodbye to the great sense of humor we enjoyed. We both had a great sense of humor. 
Thanks. Um, and an excellent, excellent friendship, I think, for a while in order for me to heal. Okay, so mirror that briefly. I hear you saying good, the good stuff you're saying goodbye to is? Is Drake, is our warm, ref our relationship, our, our friendship, our being able to talk with one another. Uh, the others, our friendship, really, that we are good friends, very good friends. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Now the next thing is the dream that won't ever come into being because of the end of the marriage. So would you say goodbye to the dream? I have to say goodbye to the dream of growing old together, losing our teeth, our hair, the whole routine. I really, I waited till I was 30 to get married because I really wanted to be right. I was so sure I was right. I really meant it when I took those vows. And the dream is that it's not going to be till death do us part. Say goodbye to that. And is there any more to the dream? In the parenting of Drake and doing it together, I know we'll always both have a part in his lives, but Drake, in my estimation, brought us so much closer, and there was that family dream, that family real tight dream. family dream. That and growing all together were my two biggest. So if I'm hearing you right, mirror that back. You're okay, saying goodbye to you're the saying dream. saying goodbye to the dream the fact that we could get old together and be old together and share our lives together and be with Drake for his graduation and everything else, which we will still do. But that uh, just a matter of us being old together, growing old together, having a relationship forever, or having a marriage forever. Okay. Now, say goodbye now. Uh, since I'm understanding you all are not saying goodbye to the relationship, you want to remain as friends, say goodbye instead to the marriage. And anything you want to say about that, to sort of say goodbye to it and to bury it. I'm going to say goodbye to the marriage. It is no longer. Um, it's a real waste. It could have been wonderful, I think, if for a lot of different reasons, and it had its downsides to a lot, but it is history. And I am saying goodbye to it. Very missed opportunity in life, though. Yeah, so I, I hear yes, that it is the waste, waste of uh, 16 years of, of friendship and relationship. Uh, and that she really, you know, uh, just seems that she's saying goodbye to the marriage. That, to the marriage. Uh, the marriage part, the being together To the part. marriage part, but mm -hmm. not to the relationship not itself. Not to the relationship. Mm -hmm. And if we had time, and I'm sorry we don't, to hear the sadness you have mm -hmm. about the bad stuff, the good stuff, and hey, to your let's, dream. let's come back and let him do that. I know it's not on the schedule thing, but let's come back, because I'd like and to hear what your hear side what of it is, to too. Say goodbye we'll, to we'll do that when we come back. Okay. <laughs> How can couples who are just starting out learn from this? We'll come back in a moment. Somebody says something that really triggers me, like 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 what you said triggered me, and I'm gonna lash out and, and yell or, or, or raise my voice. There's nothing wrong with that. But you think there's something because you think that's the old I am, because you think it's not right. Because you don't know how to handle a temper. I don't like to be treated that way, and I hate when you talk to me that way. And I hate when you talk to me the way you did, which is what triggered me to do that. I asked you a question. You did not ask me a question. You made an accusation. You did not ask. Did you call so-and-so's office to get our table switch? You said, with your, with your little prissy attitude that you do and your little face with your upturned nose, I heard you call into your office and handed it in. You're so attractive when you make those faces. I can't freaking believe that I just got accused of something that I didn't even do. One of the therapists I think I've pro probably over the years learned the most from um, is doing this technique. The technique you're doing called mirroring is not just if you're going to be separating in your relationships, although I think this is a wonderful thing. To, don't you think this is good, Karen? It's a wonderful thing to do, but it's also what couples I've, I've seen on this show time and time again. People get in arguments, and the one person never hears what the other yes. person's saying. They argue, they talk, they argue, they fight, but nobody ever hears. The mirroring technique is just to make sure that you were heard, yes. because in most cases, that's what most people just really want, is to know that you were heard. Is that correct? And without the, yes, and without the uh, mirroring back, 
you may think that you heard, but right. you respond to what you made up rather than to what was sent. So consequently, your behavior looks really crazy because right. it has nothing to do with what was said. Right. So, so that's why you have the person mirror that's back to make sure that mirror, what they, you said was heard the way you said it. We right. want to be sure they got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. So now we want to do the goodbye process okay. uh, with you. And um, so start again with what is the bad stuff? Start with the bad stuff that won't ever be again with the end of this uh, marriage. Okay. And I'm uh, going to ask you to do the mirroring process back. I want to say goodbye to feeling third and fourth choice. And, and tell her. Where our son came first, which was understandable, but her parents came second, her friends came third. And, and said your friends. Your, your friends, friends. Your parents. Came third. Mm -hmm. And then me. In every consideration, in every way she you, handled all you, of our say you you in every way that you handled all of our our friendships it was always your friends my friends you didn't really care for but it was always your friends and I want to say goodbye to um, when you would come home from work instead of saying hello to me wave at me go right to the phone and call up your mother and then your friends and two or three hours later got around to me I want to say goodbye to when I would say, let's clean the house, let's get, you know, the floors, let's take care of it. And you would say, but I don't have any color today. I want to go by the pool. I don't have any color. And you would leave and go by the pool. So I want to say goodbye to so all I that. I want to say goodbye to all that. Okay. That was... Now, let me just stop you at that point so we can get to the next piece of this, too, and ask you to briefly mirror that back. So if I've got it, you're saying goodbye to. If I got it, you're saying goodbye to being third, fourth, and fifth, my putting our son, which was understandable, but my family and friends ahead of you that when you wanted to do things and accomplish things, I brushed that off too, and basically to sum it up, that I never ever made you number one. Right. D did I get it right? Did I get it right? You got it right. Okay, now shift to uh, the good stuff that won't ever be again with the end of this marriage. So sad. Okay, the good Say stuff. Say goodbye to that. Was a lot of fun, a lot of good conversations. And tell uh, it to her. Your enthusiasm about everything you did from who came in to work and who you talked to and that I never had to really carry a conversation that you could carry the whole conversation that uh, you were always smiling you were always up you were never depressed that when you were depressed it was over minor things like oh just nonsense things I can't even think of them and uh, that we could go places and do things and I never had to be embarrassed of you or that you never would be you know and let me just bring you to the close of that. Say goodbye to all of that, yeah. all the good stuff. Would you just say that? I'd like to say goodbye to all that and okay. more. If quickly. I'm hearing you right, then you are saying goodbye to my very upbeat attitude, my enthusiasm for life, love, and friends, and the things that we were able to do together and share together. Am I hearing you correctly? Except for the friends, yes. Except for the friends. Okay. okay. And so let's just move on to the next piece oh, and, and not take time to, to correct that. And now would you say goodbye to your dream in the in the marriage. Say and I say goodbye and I to say the goodbye dream. I say goodbye to the dream of being with you and sharing all the things that we've accomplished, you know, all the the hardship that we went through so that we could go to Florida and retire and relax and enjoy our life and enjoy Drake and uh, be with him, mostly be with him. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying goodbye to the dream of um, the hardship of the years we've put together and the life that we've made for each other and mostly being with Drake. Am I hearing you right? Yes. Okay. And now, uh, very quickly, and so now I say goodbye to the marriage. And now I say goodbye to the marriage. And say goodbye. 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 Okay. When we come back, Thank we're going to say much. hello to a marriage. Uh, we're going to be talking to some people who are just, you know, in the midst. They've been dating for 14 months, and uh, it's just starting out. But first, take a look now at how Harville and his wife, Helen, resolved some of their conflicts. Take a look. I sort of resented you for not being an extension of me. Mm -hmm. I, 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 well, I, I, I thought, well, why can't, it, why can't he be relaxed if I'm a little late? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he can pick up a paper. He's always complaining he doesn't have time to read, and he could just flow with it. <laughs> And I had to learn to first 
acknowledge that you were never going to flow with my being late. Yeah. Then second, really respect it and honor it. And then, and now I think it's rather charming but, and dear. And, then I won't flow with you being late. <laughs>
Jay, for the next month, I'd like, when we do go to a party, I'd like you to come up to me and introduce me to people and to... How, to how many times? Well, once or twice? Uh, three times. Three times. Three times. <laughs> if I, Madeline, if I got it right, if you want me to, in the course of the next month, we go to these parties to come up to you at least three times <laughs> and tell you that I'm thinking of you and that I know you're there. Do I have this right? Okay. And well, now, can I just stop you here and yeah. say and make note of how important this is? Well, the reason why this struck me, I don't know if it struck you guys too, and you guys watching home, is because so many times, like when she said that at first, yes. like I'd like you to come up to me at a party, you have in your own mind about how many times would make you comfortable. That's right. But he doesn't know what those times are unless you say it, but you assume that because you've now said, I want you to come up to me at the party, that he knows how many times. That's why the how many times, although it sounded a little corny, really was really it's, it's effective and essential. It's the ultimately the critical part of it in, because in she has the picture in her mind, he's got to get it in his mind and then match the picture, otherwise it doesn't work. Right, because he could come up to her one time, and, and, and that's in his mind what it was, and she was saying, but you only came up once. Yes, and he that's said, well, I did it. Yeah. And, and, um, and then she's going to say. So the <clears throat> close this off by thinking about this is a gift. Um, can you see yourself gifting her, not a trade, not a bargain, not a deal, but a pure gift that you can give her yeah. that within that uh, time frame and that frequency as a practice and training period? Yes. Okay, so would you say that to her? Tell her okay. exactly what the gift will be. Your gift will be, <laughs> um, if I understand this right, um, from now on, for the next month, when we go to an affair or party or something, I will try to find you at least three times. I will find you I three. Will, I will find I you three, three times. times. <laughs> and, sorry. I will find you three times and just say, how are you doing? Are you okay? You know, is everything all right? Okay, so right? you say thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, you're welcome. All right. Coming up, how to stop choosing problem partners. We'll be right back. Okay, what did you want to say, Harville? Well, I was going to say that it's very important to, in this exercise of uh, changing a frustration into a behavior change request, that the uh, response be a gift rather than a trade. Right. Because often he could say, I'll do that if. Yeah. And if he says that, then it really negates it as a value to her. So that it has to be done as a pure gift. Okay. How do you keep just stop choosing the wrong partners? Because people continue to repeat the same patterns. You know that repeating the pattern because the pattern yes. you're repeating is about, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the way to stop choosing the wrong partner is a hard question to answer because the person that you're going to choose is the person that you're attracted to. Right. And the person you're attracted to is going to be somebody who is going to be a source of pain and frustration for you. Oh, and that's off. inevitable. <laughs> and we'll just so keep doing it. You'll just keep doing and why, it. Okay, let's just stop right there. Why is that inevitable? Why is it inevitable? Because you always pick somebody who's similar to your parents. And you'll bring to that person the unresolved issue with your parents. And you'll fall in love with that person. That'll be the person that's attractive to you. And that's the romantic part, that's though. The romantic but that romantic part. thing's going to go, isn't it? It's going to go in the relationship. To yeah. order to stop choosing the wrong partner is that you have to begin thinking about picking, becoming conscious yourself of the kind you pick, yeah. knowing you're going to, but start um, picking a person who is more conscious, more interested in what's going on in them, in their own patterns and relationship, so that you can talk with them about this rather than just act it out unconsciously, everybody just doing the same thing all the time. Become aware, is the person that I'm talking to now somewhat interested in how they interact with a partner or are they always blaming everybody else? You know, all women are the same, all men are the same. But if they say, you know, sometimes I get upset and I blow my stack and I wonder why is that? Then you've got somebody who's probably, possibly conscious. And if you don't have somebody who is curious about themselves, you probably should keep looking until you find somebody who is curious about themselves. Okay. And one of the things your wife, Helen, said in the series of tapes that you all, yes. that we've been showing and that you all have done called Getting the Love That You Find, is that she doesn't need you to fulfill herself. Yes. And that what she has is her own spirituality. And because you have your sense of spirituality, which is not the same as religion, right. but your sense of spirituality and her sense of spirituality, that you make each other better. And I think the problem is so many people choose a partner to fill the hole inside themselves. Yes. Isn't that correct? And, and that's true. You fill the hole inside yourself. And 
But oh, you have to fill that hole. Well, not really. There's a certain truth in that, that the partner really has to respond to your needs. Once you get in a committed partnership, this is where with Helen and me, we have really understood each other's childhood wound and have responded to that wound. That doesn't mean she fills up my hole and I fill up hers, but it does mean that a need I have from childhood, she's responsive to. What you have to do is to become aware of what that wound is right. and be willing to ask for behavior, just as here we're talking about a wound, to ask for a behavior that will uh, meet the need, not re-injure you, but learn how to do that so your partner's motivated to do it rather than criticizing your partner so that they're not motivated to And you it. can't do that if that partner is only interested in their own self, whatever. Oh, definitely not. Yeah, De definitely and that's not why you. marriages don't work Th sometimes. That's why marriages don't work. There's no commitment to mutual healing and mutual helping. Because that's what marriage is, a commitment That's what to marriage is. Mar marriage, marriage is a structure for healing. And if you do meet each other's childhood needs, you'll have the marriage of your dreams. And if you don't, you'll have the marriage of your nightmares. <laughs> and you can predict that. That's, okay. The unconscious is pretty non-negotiable about the fact that there are certain needs that have to be met sometime in your life, and it's going to bring those needs to a particular person in adulthood who reminds you of your parents. <sighs> I hope you got it. I hope you got it. Thanks for watching the Best of the Oprah Show, Spirit Edition, on Super Soul Sunday. See you next time.